Welcome to the Transform Sales Podcast, where forward-thinking business leaders come to share their experiences and ideas, learn from each other, and amplify their results together. Hey guys, Amir Ryder with the Transform Sales Podcast. I got my guest, Ben Goldberg, CEO. How's it going, Ben? Great, great. Thank you for being on, thank you for being on our show. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for the invite. Looking forward to today's conversation. Lo- love the name, Sales Gig. I'm like, it tells you exactly what you do just by the name. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That was, that, was, that was a fun one to figure out. So, so I, I appreciate you joining. Um, I was glad I was catching up with you. I think for us on this show, the goal is really to educate listeners, right? So people listening to the show are either companies or sales leaders or leaders that have hired agencies before and fire them, ones that are currently working with agencies and want to recruit more and expand territory, and then first-time buyers, right? So the idea here is to be super transparent and actually talk about the uncomfortable things, the mistakes people make with the idea that they can learn and not make the same mistakes that buyers have made over and over again, because we are talking about revenue and revenue is super sensitive. Um, And the idea is just to help both buyers and sellers uh, play nice with each other. Before we get into that, love to hear your story. Love to hear how you got into the industry and how you founded SalesGate. Great. Well, at first, thanks for, thanks for the invite. I love what you're doing, love what you're doing for the marketplace and uh, just glad to be having the conversation. Um, in terms of how I got into sales gigs, great story. Um, I owned uh, two successful businesses in the past. Both were B2B services businesses. Both had successful exits. And uh, if I had known what I know now, then I probably would be a little bit taller and I'd probably have a little bit more hair, right? Um, I, I sold my last company to a large organization. It was a platform acquisition. And I watched how they took a very sophisticated sales development organization with the right sales enablement tools, the right sales tech stack, the right sales training team, and turned an SDR shop into a really successful growth engine for what was my company. And it was, it just impressed me. Um, and we scaled the business exponentially over the three years that I was uh, leading that organization through their, through their team. Um, and so when I left, um, I wasn't ready to retire and I wasn't ready to, um, start a consulting business, I saw what we did and I said, boy, you know, if I knew now what I knew then, um, and I can share that back with other small business owners, entrepreneurs, organizations, and help them build, build that in their organization, that would be successful. That would be good. And so that's what we set out to do. And so sales gig started off um, building our first clients, doing outbound lead generation using LinkedIn email calling to set appointments for companies and built that into a successful business that we scaled today. And it's been, it's just been a really fun ride. We've been doing it for about three years now. So basically you, 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 you built the business development engine that was able to build valuation for a company that you sold, right? Mm-hmm. And then you saw that you had this process, you were an expert at it, and then you took the process you made that built the success and made it into a service. Correct. And fractionalized it, right? Because small to mid-sized organizations can't afford what an enterprise organization needs. And so what we did is we funded the enterprise level tech stack and data tools and systems and processes and training. And then we fractionalized it back to back to organizations so that they can scale up their own organizations. And truth. I'm like, it, make, it makes sense. I'm like, people go out there trying to hire VPs of sales, CROs, people who have the experience in a world that's changing so fast, but they have access to people like Ben Goldberg that actually have exits under their resume and that they can be hired at a fraction of the price through a service, but yet they're like, we don't outsource. Yeah, right. We hire VPs, we hire VPs of sales, even though Gong tells us that they're in and out in 18 months, but we don't like data, right? No. We want we want people to buy our data tools, but we don't we don't read data, right? Um, that's a good story because it's it's actually the story of most successful companies, right? The, the, the we work, the, the rework model, not the we work model from uh, the base camp guys, mm-hmm. right? They built a, a, a project management software to fix their own problems and went to market with it. So um, you're also running a successful play off a successful play. Yeah, I mean, look at base camp. Like look at base camp. They, they're based actually out of Chicago. Um, they, they never took any outside money and they built a very successful organization and that allowed them to be true to who they are and what they wanted to accomplish. It, that's just the same thing that we're doing here at sales gig and you know others in the space are the ones that don't take outside money and are building it from the ground up based upon a cash flow model of successful outcomes that we've provided to different clients is a really good thing to be looking at in terms of you know the types of organizations that somebody would want to look at for 
you know, call it outsourced. Leasing, isn't it, right? isn't it almost scary that you're saying you're like, what you're saying is not the normal, right? right? Like I'm an expert, I fix my own problems. I run profitable companies. I don't run Ponzi schemes. Right. And that's not the normal. Yeah. Right. And, and, and a lot of people, you probably read the book, the hard thing about hard things about Idris and Horowitz, right? Um, you have, oh, yeah. If you really think about it, it's a little bit strange that the guy raised $100 million in the Series A for Rook Software, talks about how he ran out of money, ran, ran more, raised more money, ran out of all, and now he's like one of the biggest VC guys. And it's, it's like almost a culture of raising money and running out of it is cool, but they never actually talk about the people who lost $200 million. So I find that strange that the profitable companies, right? Like I didn't raise money either at CloudTask. I had to be profitable. I tried raising money and I was profitable and people didn't like me because I was profitable. <laughs> they wanted, they want, it was strange, right? Um, good timing. Cause I think the companies like yours are the ones that are going to survive and thrive. Right. Um, and you can stay customer centric. So that's for me, I think, I think you're, 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 you're running the play, right? And it's ironic because anybody engaging you probably can learn a lot from just running and building big businesses. I, I bet you, you have people that come to hire you that probably, we don't outsource sales. And then you look at them, you're like, man, I, I sold a business for, I'm not gonna say number, right? Like for where you wanna be, right? Like I've actually got the resume and they kind of turn a blind eye to it. Well, um, we help them go, we help them go from here to there. Like that's what we're all designed to do. Like, like we're out to help organizations find a way to go outbound and the truth is if they're coming to an organization like ours, any of the companies out there, they haven't figured out the playbook yet. And so every playbook is different depending upon the industry, the company, where they're at in their life cycle, how they buy, what the processes are, what differentiates them, what their product market fit is. All those things change. We call it a playbook, but it's different by organization, industry type, right? Um, and so all those mm -hmm. things kind of play into that. And we've got to make sure that we align with the organization so that we take them from where they're at today to where they're looking to go. And the biggest problem is a lot of organizations in our space are sitting there trying to maximize the, moto, the amount of monthly reoccurring revenue that they make. And they're also trying to get the longest contract terms they can get, you know, whether it's three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, whatever. And they're not playing to the right outcomes. And a right outcome is helping an organization build repeatable processes that create pipeline that result in net one revenue. And if we think yeah. through that on the front end and we get on the same side of the table as our clients early and we start small and scale up, that hurdle rate that we have to get over as we're building the pipeline and building the funnel of success allows us to become a good partner to them. It's organizations that try to get the most revenue early and then have to build pipeline and set unrealistic expectations. That, that, that can create a negative connotation in the relationship. It, it makes it for a much higher turn rate. And it's, it's disappointing uh, to see that when it, it occurs. And that's why you hear so much of, hey, I tried an outbound team or an outsourced team and, and didn't have the type of success we were looking for. Yeah, I like also at the same time, I think the concept is that like, like failure is success now bound because you always have to be changing, right? Iterated, I think, iterated, I think look at, right? Like, if you look at some of the facts, right? Like I think like the companies that were in the S&P 500 like 200 years ago, like stayed in there for like 100 years, right? I think now, the, the, the amount of years that a company stays in, in the NASDAQ is like, it's shrinking and it's shrinking because changing is happening faster and it's, everything's faster, cheaper, more efficient. And if you think about it, you know, if you're going to hire a team to run a play, knowing that the plays are changing faster and faster and faster, it gives more value in my opinion to what agencies are doing because agencies are prepared for the testing and the experiments and, 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 and people are focused on the ROI, but they're not understanding that what was good today was is bad tomorrow, right? Like if you hit five million in revenue this year off a hundred million in pipeline arbitrary numbers, and you have a forecast of fifteen million, you might have to raise five x more pipeline, right? So it's like two plus two equals four, two plus two plus two equals six, right? They like think that they hire an SDR, it's either internal or external, and I'm like, well, what about internal does four, external does four, you got eight, yeah. Right. Like, like, like you're, you're, you're telling me that you want to cut, 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 cut when you need to actually be exponentially growing your pipeline. Right. It's, it's like you need more upfront than you do at the end. So they're also hiring wrong. Um, but we have, we can talk about that forever. What I want to know is tell me about the most common mistakes that buyers make when they book time with you. Right. Um, what do you, what do you almost like, man, I wish. I wish they weren't doing like, what is the, 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 the repeating mistake that just kind of 
hurts the bottom line for the companies that are hiring agencies and of course the agencies themselves. Yeah, I've got a couple that I don't know, I suppose stands out to me. Oh, I know. Um, I, I think the first is expectations. And so a lot of companies that come to an outsource shop have you know, built their business on some version of referrals or networking, or they've had some inbound leads that they've, they've been able to transition into successful pipeline and, and, and net new business. Um, but when you start to move outbound, the expectation alignment on what success looks like and what a good meeting is, isn't aligned. And so working with a client to understand where they sit on the continuum of a qualified meeting. Is it a title? Is it a company in the right ICP? Is it BANT qualification? What does that look like? If you can make sure that the client understands what we're going to provide and what they should expect, that's one. we got to make sure that we have alignment on what a good meeting is. Um, I think that's one. Do you also think there needs to be alignment on, on terminology? Absolutely. You have right. to define that, right? Like they have to understand what they're going to get and how they're going to handle that. But that takes me to two, which is a lot of times I've found that um, we can do a great job. I mean, I, I remember one client, I lost, the, I lost the client, unfortunately. We had set 20 something meetings for them in a month. It was with the director level HR in the type of ICP that they were going after. We set 20 some meetings for them in the month. And they came back to us and they said, of the 20 meeting, the 20 that showed, they said they couldn't build pipeline off of that. And like, you know, sometimes when you jump out of the water, you jump off a boat, you should hit water, right? And so that told me they had a different level problem. They had something going on with their sales team that they weren't effective at being able to take a, a cold lead and turn that into a demo or into pipeline. And so the down channel is that we need to make sure that the the salespeople that are consuming the leads that are set are prepared to handle that, or coach, train, develop, mentor, guided to know how to do that best. And sometimes that's on us to do that training when we see that that's there. So it's not just about the appointment setting or the meeting. It's also making sure that the people that take that meeting know how to run with it. Yeah, so but like you'll notice, right? Like when we talk about this, and by the way, I'm gonna close this door. Yeah, I got loud teammates, very, very loud people in here. It, it, it's interesting because even the way you speak about that, the problem, you flow in from a buying issue to an operational issue, right? And that shows where your mind is because as agency owners, not one agency owner cares about winning your business. They all care about keeping it. That's correct. Bottom line. Yeah. Bottom line. It costs a lot of money to run up a program. And if you guys end up not working with an agency for three to six months, it's not profitable. So you could see how he answers the question. It's already more about the feedback that you get, right? It's almost as if, what they're hiring isn't just somebody to make meetings. What they're hiring is a top of the funnel mechanism to dish out meetings, to hear feedback back and to make adjustments, right? And if an account executive team thinks for a second that somebody coming to your website who knows they have a problem, wants to get a demo, you can go and say, hey, Ben, saw you signed up. Um, what were you hoping to get from this call? What were you, what were you trying? And they're qualifying because the person wants to buy. It's a, it's, but it's, it's if somebody, you want to hire an agency, yeah, yeah. they're raise, they're, they're hand raisers. They're order they're 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 glorified order takers because they're taking the hand raisers. They're not out there doing the the hunting side of the business where they're out. But really then they dragging. treat it the same. Yep. yep. You you got a guy you have an SDR that is on sales gig. He touches a contact. Let's call it twenty five times over forty five days, and the guy goes, you know what? You know what? You've been super professional, super persistent. I'm going to give you 20 minutes. You're going to earn my time. Then they get on the call with the kind of executive. And the guy's like, "Look, what did you come here for today?" And he's like, "What do you mean? You've been calling me for 30 days. Like, like, kind of, you know." And they're not adjusting. We see that all the time because they're not really adjusting to. Hey, I appreciate you taking the time to learn more about today. How we can fast, and then going into qualification. And then guess what they do too? Follow up once, right? And then who gets the axe? Is it the AE or is it the the agency? So that takes me to the second thing, which Typically. Is, you know, there, there, there's two things, right? Like the next two, when we talk to clients, obviously we, we want to differentiate our service, but they have to have patience in a buy in, in the process, right? Like, you know, if, 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 if a team, whether it's internal or external, if they start doing outbound lead generation, I apply the rule of 78. I don't know if you've heard that before. It's a, it's a very common rule that's used, um, came out of Harvard. It was this concept that, you know, if, as you start to build your funnel, um, you're able to identify by week, by month, 
just how big your funnel can get. Rule of 78, it's super cool to check out. You can use it for sales planning and forecasting, but you can also flip it on its side and use it for lead generation. And that's like, if you- It's called the rule of 78. Rule of 78, super cool. So like the idea is like, if I go after a hundred people today and I'm able to talk to 10 of them, out of 10, how many meetings am I gonna set? One, maybe two? So in month one, maybe I get, or that period of time, I get one or two meetings. But in month two, if I go after the next hundred, I might get one or two meetings, but I'm going to do follow up and re-engagement from month one. And so now maybe I get three or four meetings in month three, net new hundred plus my follow up plus my follow up. And now my funnel starts. So you can mathematically come up with what type of results you're going to get in a way that allows clients to see the model and understand that they need to play the long game. Because if you apply the rule of 78 to what their close rates are and their sales cycles are, you can start to come up with estimates that are meaningful and representative of their industry and their type of organization. Now, we always have to bench low, so set low expectations and overachieve those expectations. The companies that go out there and I always get a kick, the people that, oh, I'll get you 100 meetings this month or whatever, like, come on. But um, yeah, that's, luck. that's the way that we think through it is how can we help them build a pipeline that's predictable, scalable, repeatable, that can then move into the rest of their organization, but they so need. So you're using energy. logic and science. We're using. Is that what you're doing? Shockingly, yes, right. Oof. Um, Oof. Shockingly. <laughs> and then the other. So it's funny bringing that point up because I did some math and I and, and I don't have this fully baked out yet, but what I realized is that the way people buy is that they try to ease into something, not understanding that actually the ramp should be higher in the beginning. If you have a million dollar pipeline and it takes X amount of time to close deals, you got a six month sales cycle. You actually need to contact more records in the beginning. You should be hiring more agencies in the beginning. It's backwards math. Yeah, right? They're telling you we have a six month sales cycle. We want an ROI in three months. And then they go ease into it. You know what they do? They, they miss forecasts. But if, right? but if they the base it off of the hand raisers, hand raisers that are saying, I have a no need right now and I'm looking to get a demo today, that's different than outbound where you're trying to build a new relationship get them into a buying cycle, make them identify that they have a problem and then take them. It's a longer buying cycle and they need to rep recognize that. And the companies that we work it's, with it's, understand it's, that. It's, and I don't even know what's a longer buyer cycle yeah. though. I, I would I would argue that it, it, it's, it's an additional source of buyers that jump into that same cycle. And I would, I would, I always say that inbound means I know I have a problem, right? Like I got kidney stones, where do I go? Mayo Clinic, right? Outbound is kind of educating people that they could have a problem. And they could then walk into a sales cycle, become an inbound lead and act the same way. Or the problem could be big enough that they buy right away. It's the long game just because you should plan, right? Accordingly to it being the long game and know that a fast sale was because of good timing. But if you plan for that fast sale, you will fail. I if you plan for the long game and let the professional process go in, you'll succeed, right? So I see this all the time I, and, 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 and I'm sure you could bring up more stories. Um, what other, so, so are people making more mistakes in the buying cycle or in the management of an ongoing campaign? Uh, I, where, where's the, where's the critical error? I think the critical error is in, in the implementation. And so implementation or the onboarding process, I think people try to rush to going outbound as quickly as possible, right? Like that's the idea. That's where the, the outcomes matter. Right. But the truth is the setup to get that right. And to make sure that. The organization is prepared to go outbound, that they have good nurture and good uh, handoffs from the SDR to the AE or whatever they call that in their organization. As long as those are smooth and they have the metrics to track within their CRM, the attribution back to how we're doing, that's where success really lies. Um, differentiating, we can all differentiate. We're all sales organizations. We know how to, to position our organizations optimally to organizations. But it's really when the rubber hits the road, how they put the processes in place to help the post meeting success happen. That's where the differentiation is. And if, and I've seen my data tells me that companies that stick with organizations and stick to the process over time, the attribution starts to really show a nice ROI as, as they continue to build up their, their funnels. Right. Do you, do you think that's a symptom of lack of education or a symptom of um, lack of ownership or that they have a problem and they chose incorrectly. And now that they didn't hit the goals, they have one chance left to hire an agency. They need 15 meetings per month or they get fired. Is it like a, is it a, what's it a result? I think of? it depends upon like, who you ask. Like, like think about the structure of your question, right? It depends upon who our buyers are. If our buyer is a CRO 
or are our buyers a CMO or the equivalent, right? Like think about the CRO, what are they measured against? Their, their, their measure is how much closed one business did they get this month, next month, this quarter, next quarter, right? Like that's their measure of success. You look at a CMO and they look at how many leads, how much, uh, how much uh, awareness did they create in the marketplace and so how much lead activation did they get? I mean, our job is lead activation. So we make the CMO look really, really good. And the CRO loves building full funnel. But if you ask them how they're scored, it's close one. And so we're in a different place than that. And so it depends upon who you're asking in the question and what they're measuring, what their, you know, what their, what their objectives are in the, in the organization from a KPI perspective. So we know how they're, how their KPIs are measured, we can then back into how we can help them look good. But we need to understand. It that. makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. And it also brings up the whole concept that sales and marketing should just be revenue, right? Like a revenue department. It, it's like, it's interesting because it's like you versus them, you know, internal versus external, and then it's you versus them marketing for sales. And it, it's, it's like these, it's like constant pointing the fingers at other people versus like, we're all in it together. We all have visibility of the full funnel. We all understand awareness, consideration, decisions. We're, we're all revenue experts and very few are revenue experts, right? Very few know the basics, you know? Um, and it's kind of interesting how that works out because oftentimes I would say agencies that possess uh, higher, more experienced uh, talent tend to get fired first over less experienced talent because they give somebody a CRO title, right? Like it's easy to give somebody you know, a, a title. And they're often blinded by that versus um, the agency you actually own is run by a company with seven exits and the experience to do what you want to do, right? So it's interesting. Um, internal versus external. What's the difference? Internal teams versus external teams? Is that the yeah, question? We're all remote together. What's the difference? Yeah, you know, um, I, I think it's expertise, right? Like if, if you're an internal team, you need to make sure that you have the the structure, both from the tech perspective, from the data perspective, from the coaching, developing, mentoring, guiding perspective to make them effective. If you have that internally, then, you know, that's not a bad option to go, right? Um, the benefit to an organization like ours is access to capacity, right? Um, and then comparing best practices. Going external, a great option for that is if you're looking to move quickly, if you're looking to build your own internal system and you want to learn, an organization like ours is dead set on one goal, which is putting the right people, process, and technology in place in order to get that production system happening. We know how to iterate. We know how to leverage data. We know how to build messaging structures. We know how to drive feedback loops to get more better outcomes for clients. And so the answer to the question is then a case-by-case -case basis depending upon the organization. So some organizations, we are an extension of their internal team. Um, we have other organizations where they're, we're the complete outsource team because that's where they're at in their stage of their, the life cycle of, of their sales and marketing organization. And so I, I think it depends on a case by case. You know what, my, my, uh, my, my, what I see, I, I, I consider anyone I give money to and a duty to do to be internal. Like if you have a clone of my DNA, Maybe you're internal, like you're my clone. But other than that, if I give you a thousand dollars and I expect something, I don't care if you're a W two ten thousand contractor freelancer agency. You're my internal mm -hmm. team. I've had W two employees leave me in a day. I've had agencies last me for ten years, right? Um, so it's like for me, I almost feel like these words are designed to distract us from the goals, right? Um, Outsourcing is bad. They're taking our jobs. Well, um, that's. A common thing you hear when people are outsourcing to like China or India, but uh, Ben is in Chicago, all American jobs, yeah. right? Does that still have the same outsourcing condition? I don't think so. Um, so it's interesting. I think the the borders will come down between outsourcing and inside, and, and people will realize that for every dollar spent, accountability needs to be held on that dollar. Like I don't know if you saw this video from a, a day of the life of a Twitter employee. Oh. She posted it on uh, YouTube, and it was like, it was like. I started off my day with the yoga uh, thing and then I got my green macchiata and then I had like one meeting and then I was stressed and I went to the decompression room and I'm like, this is insane. Like that's a W2 making 200K, you know what I mean? And then the agency that's working for Twitter is getting the shit yelled at them working 24 hours a night and it's just, people are taking advantage of the what's created, right? The distraction and, and then both sides are taking advantage of it. But those days are over. Let's talk about who you can help the most, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to get you to talk about 
your best customer profile so anybody listening can can come find you. So I know that you work with a, a wide spectrum of people. So if I ask you these questions, it doesn't mean no to anybody else listening, but let's start off this way. Computer software or services? You can only pick one. Services. Okay. Service company, startup, series A, private equity, public. Uh, startup to small business. Um, startup to small business. Five to thirty million in revenue, sweet spot. Yeah, it's somewhere in that range. That sounds about right. Not too small. We, you know, sub sub a million dollars. They don't they don't really have product market fit yet. Don't have the budgets for it to consistently be able to scale a program. But you know, five to thirty, five to fifty million. That's that's generally the range that that we see most successful. Why why service? Because you know you you go where you know. And I spent a lot of time building successful businesses on the service side, and so I I like to play in places where. I can add meaningful value and my team can add meaningful value to the conversation. We have plenty of software and SaaS related organizations that we partner with. Um, but if you give me a choice, I, I go there. I would also say the other thing to ask a question on is who their buyer personas are. Like, like it, we talk a lot about industries or who are their buyer personas, right? Who, who, we talk about <laughs> the segment, right? So like, are, are they selling to HR operations, accounting, finance? Like we should make sure that there's, there's, that they know the best ways to engage at the buyer level and in the industries that their customers are in, not the industries they're necessarily in. I think that plays a critical role in success outcomes. Is there a is there an industry, a service industry and buyer persona that you guys do particularly well in? Right? Like I'm listening to this, I'm like, holy shit. These guys are my guys that I've been waiting yeah, for. Yeah, any, anything in what HR operations, um, finance, tech, those th that's where we, th if, if, if they're selling to companies that those are the, the type of buyers, we do incredibly well. Um, the one You said HR first, right? Did you say that intentionally? Uh, it's just because that's the types of organizations that, that I used to sell into and I know pretty well. And through our organization, we've built quite that a That sounds like a reason why I want to work with you. Yeah, right. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Yeah. I, I think that's, I think that's, I think that's, um, I think that's a reason why, um, I, you know, we as CloudTask, when we listen to people's needs, we're going to be listening for, for that to then bring them to you. That's our job. I'm an SDR guys, by the way, I'm an SDR for Ben. So I've, 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 I've probably gone back to the SDR seat where I have to listen to the amazing agency owners like Ben to what they do super well. Uh, and then take who's coming in and match them because the conversation goes super smoothly, right? I'm like, hey, you're a service company. Um, you're targeting HR tech. I know an agency named Sales Gig who you should speak to because the owner has experience on the HR people. It's, it's like the talk track is smooth, right? And yeah. it just flows right into it and then they get better results. So, um, you know, listen, I appreciate all this feedback. It's been awesome. Like this is, you know, this has been motivating for me because I, I transparently, I get a lot of uh, people interested in, in um, selling services to HR personas. I think there'll be more and more because I think there's just more even global payment technologies out there. So I think HR people are getting introduced to just new technologies to manage global teams, which is going to be a, a thing for five, 10 years. Um, and I, I look forward to helping those people find you. Anybody who's listening to this, how can they contact you? How can they book a meeting with you? Where can they find you? Yeah, great question. So uh, they can go out to salesgig.com. Uh, all the contact information flows to our team, including my contact information is up there. Um, or, you know, my email, ben at salesgig.com uh, is an easy way to email me uh, for, for more information. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty easy to get a hold of uh, by design and would always welcome that type of a conversation. I, I appreciate you setting up today's conversation. I enjoyed it. Um, and, and I hope that the folks that listened got some value. Now, the, the, the first of many, you're the expert. Our job is just to give you an audience. We want people to just listen and, and learn so that they can hit the goals. I'm like, look, no, there's no high five at winning a deal. There's a high five and they're like, I sold my business. Thank you, Ben, right? So the high five is not at the beginning, it's at the end. And I know that too, because of my service days and, I, and, and it's easy to read in your energy. I appreciate you being a guest on the Transform Sales Podcast. And guys, Ben at salesgigs.com. Check out his website. Um, and reach out to him and he'll help you. Ben, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thank Take you. care. I appreciate it.